What's going on everybody? Welcome to another edition of Axe Creation. And on this episode of Interaction, we're going to talk Kiesel guitars, finding the right gear, some atonality versus chromaticism, and borrowing chords from other keys. All right, everybody, how you doing? It's been a good couple of weeks. Um, again, I'm digging the questions that are coming in. I say it every time, but I do like the questions, and I do like the gear questions as well as the theory questions. So uh, let's not waste too much time and jump right into it, all right? First question. Okay, so I have to ask, just how many Kiesels do you own? Started looking at them today and watching your older videos. I like what I see. You don't have a general gear video, do you? Um, no, to answer that, the last part of that question, I, I don't have a general gear question. Maybe I'll do one. I don't have a studio, you know, I don't have a crazy studio, but everybody seems to ask me that, so I'll probably do one soon. Um, as far as Kiesel goes, um, I see this question a lot, and I've received this question a lot. I, as you guys can tell, over the last several months, I've been using nothing but Kiesels in my videos, and I do have an arrangement set with, with Kiesel guitars. I know Jeff over at Kiesel and the rest of the Kiesel family. They, they're local to San Diego, as am I, so I've, we've developed a nice relationship and they've treated me great. And I do use a lot of their guitars, only their guitars, in my videos. And I do have a 7-string Vader, and um, yeah, hopefully I have some more soon. I'm probably going to be ordering myself an Aries. I really dig those. I thought Jeff did a really good job in the Aries. And um, maybe the new DC with the bevel that are coming out, they're really nice as well. Some of the new uh, pickup configurations that are going to be available too. So. I want to get an Aries bolt-on um, with a humbucker single single. Really nice guitar. It's fast. It's light. I really dig it. Really did a good, did a good job. Cool. Next question. I've been a guitarist for quite a few years. However, I never really figured out how to find gear. It seems to me that I'm. It's. Uh, excuse me. It seems I'm going to need a gigging amp soon, and I have no idea where to start. Any tips, such as brands, combo versus head, cab prices. Basically, any advice finding a good amp that works for you? Well, this is a really good question, and I, I can't really give a one answer or recommend brand. I don't really know what music you're playing, um, or what you need, or what other gear you have, you know, what you're into, and that's going to determine a lot. But I guess a general rule of thumb, I would check out combo amps, either a 112 or a 212. Uh, any decent venue that you're going to be playing in is going to have a sound system and a PA and they're going to mic you up. So the days where you need a 120 watt head with a 4x4 with a 4 you know 12 cabinet, it's a little unnecessary unless you're in a large band and you need to push that much sound or you're playing bigger venues. But like I said, most venues are going to mic you up anyway. So for portability and gigging purposes, a nice combo amp goes a long way. And you can go anything from a Fender amp, a Fender combo amp, that'll give you really nice cleans, a nice little slightly overdriven sound. If you, you know, drive it, push it to break up, it works well with pedals. Or you can look into other things. If you if you play heavier music, you know, the, the Black Star amps are really nice. Um, I, I have a Line 6 uh, DT50, which is a combo amp, the Bogner Tube amp. And that does a great job for me when I have to go out and play some gigs. Um, combo amps can get a little heavy, but what are you going to do, right? It's a combo amp. Um, so I would look into that. It, again, it, it depends on what you're looking for. I know there are some PV combo amps that are really nice. Um, basically, with those three brands, you can you can do a whole lot, uh, depending on your budget, really. You can spend anything from $500 all the way, you know, 1000 plus. But it really depends on what, what you're looking for. I would either go... Um, like a Fender combo amp, a Black Star combo amp, one of those two, they have a plethora of sounds that you can run with and they work well with pedals. And they, you know, yeah. So with that, and as far as other gear, is finding gear and pedals and stuff like that, again, that really depends on you. I'm more of a minimalist when it comes to a setup, especially if I'm running pedals. Um, I like to run a volume pedal. I like to control my volume with the pedal rather than the knob on the guitar. Um, I don't like taking my hand away. And I just like being, I step, I just stand on it the whole show and I'm constantly doing that, going from like a full-blown distortion to a, maybe a slightly semi-dirty sound without having to change channels on the amp. I find that really useful. Um, if you're going to be playing leads, a uh, delay is going to help a lot. Um, you can throw reverb on there. A lot of amps have reverb built in, um, but if you have delay, it's going to do wonders for any lead 
any leads that you're doing. And outside of anything, outside of any other than that, it's really personal preference. You know, choruses are really nice. So, you know, uh, a chorus, a delay, and a volume pedal for me, maybe a wah, depending, again, depending on what you're playing. And outside of that, you know, you don't really need a noise gate unless you have a completely noisy rig. Phaser and flangers and other modulation effects, again, it's all personal preference. You don't need to have all of that stuff to play gigs unless the music you're playing or covering requires that sound. So I would do that. And at that point, you might want to look into like an all-in-one. There are plenty of them out there. The Line 6, I forgot what they what the model they make, but they make up like a medium size and a large one where it's just pedal emulation. I would check out one of those. I think like the M9, I think they call it. Um, off the top of my head, I don't I don't remember, but I've heard those and played with those. Those are really cool, kind of give you an all in one some presets so you're not stomping all over the place. So you got your combo amp, you got your M9, you're good, you, you're good to go. I mean, the, that should accomplish a lot for you. Awesome question. And you know, if you watch this and you see your question up there, let's talk about it in the comments. Let's tell me more about your situation, all right? Next question. This might be a weird question, but if you're writing something that has a lot of chromaticism in it, how do you know what key you're playing in, and are you playing atonally or something else? Um, there's a difference between playing chromatically and atonally, right? Atonally is actually a subgenre of music, and there are rules and regulations that it comes to writing atonal music. It's not just playing whatever you want. That's not what atonal means. Uh, atonal does mean a lack of key center, Right, so you're really um, glossing over. There's really no home, right? There's no root, okay? Um, like I said, and, and there's like 12 tone rows and all of that stuff. It's very, very serialistic and it's, it's very different from chromaticism, right? Chromaticism, depending on what you're playing, is more of filling in the gaps with chromatic notes or just putting in some chromatic lines. And that's not atonal at all. Very, very, very different. I think I've covered this before. And so if you're playing something that has a lot of chromaticism in it, it just has a lot of chromaticism in it, and, you, and it has a certain sound. And if you're constantly just going up and down in chromatic lines, half steps, um, too much, it's going to sound really old, really fast. You know, or if you're playing a solo lines, melodic lines, you're playing chromaticism, a lot of times you're playing them as passing notes in between, right? In, in between your scale patterns, so if you're running through scale pattern, your pattern is three, five, seven on the fretboard, right? You could go three, five, six, seven and fill in those gaps. Or if you're, if it's five, seven, eight fret pattern, you go five, six, seven, eight, and that you know that's chromaticism. And you don't want to land on those notes. Obviously, they're just there to fill up space and give you a chromatic line. But yeah, chromaticism and, and atonal are very different music. And if you are playing something that is chromatic in nature, you're still usually going to have some kind of um, push and pull to some sort of key center. And there's going to be some sort of resolution when you stop on this chord and it sounds done. You're like, oh, how did that happen? Right? So in that case, you just have to be aware of how keys and chord progressions work. All right? Good question. Again, we can keep that one down. That, that's, a, that's a fun topic to talk about. And it's kind of leading into the next question. I've been wondering for quite a while now how to use chromatics in songwriting. In terms of chord progression like Grace by Jeff Buckley, for example, uses a lot of chords that aren't part of the key. I've tried to use chromatic chords in my songwriting, but sometimes it just sounds wrong, and I'm curious on how to make it make these chords fit into a song. Really great question, and it, it is hard to do to mix in chords outside of a key, because it does sound wrong, especially if you're not used to it. I wouldn't refer to these chords as chromatic chords, because that's not really what they are. And you can interject chords that are from other keys a couple different ways. You can borrow from either parallel or related keys, relative keys, or you can use chord substitutions. All right. And like I said, it does sound wrong, but it only sounds wrong because you're, you might not be used to it. Right. You might not, you might not be used to the outside sound. So it sounds off to you or it sounds wrong. And you'll be surprised when you start mixing chords from other keys, how they can blend together with a melody, right? So if you're just strumming some chords along on your guitar, it might not seem to fit, but if you have a cohesive melody that kind of flows through the chord progression, it's gonna pull it all together really nicely. Um, it does, you do need some kind of theory. It does help to have that, to understand chord scales and you know circle of fifths, or just 
key and key signatures in general, so you know the relationships between them and where to draw from. You know, keys that are very similar, like C major and G major, or even D major. There's not a big difference between those when it comes to say accidentals, sharps or flats. So you can pull chords from those other keys, and it works because they're not too far off from each other. But it will make a big difference if you pull chords from say C major to A flat major. There's a big difference there in in the amount of notes that are different, and the bigger the difference there are, the the more awkward it's going to sound at first, right? But like I said, there there are some simple ways drawing from um, relative minor um, or parallel minor, I should say. So if you're writing a key, uh, key um, chord progression in the key of C, right, and you're strumming C, F, and G, you can borrow from C minor so that you have um, different chords to draw from, but they're still related to C, and they're going to push and pull towards C. So that's a really a great way to do that. And you've heard it before. Right? If you instead of the F major, you play instead of the major four chord, you could play a minor four chord. Right? So that's one way to really do it. Um, chord substitutions are very common. Right? So if you're playing a C chord in a key, you have basically like the one, the three, and the six chord. They're all going to sound very similar to each other, and they're basically the same harmony. So instead of, say, the C chord, you can play an E minor chord. You're just substituting that for one another. Or if you want to get some really chromatic stuff in there and you're playing like a dominant chord, you can use what they call a tritone substitution. Right? So if you're playing a G7 chord, you can move up a tritone or a flat 5 and play a dominant chord on that note. Right? It creates a very altered sound and an outside sound. And that also creates chromatic lines in your movement. Right? For example, if you're playing a 2 5 one in the key of C, you have a D minor chord, and then a G7 chord, and then a C chord. Well, the tritone substitution is going to be D flat, so essentially you're going D, D flat, C, right? A nice chromatic line moving down. And I would also practice moving chords like minor and major thirds apart from each other, because that will put you in different keys, and you hear that a lot. You know, so I can play, say, an E minor chord, strum it along, and then move it up to G minor. It'll still sound good with each other, and but they're out, they're unrelated keys, so you're changing keys there. So it's it's tough to just describe in, in this context. Maybe I'll make a lesson on it, um, but we can definitely talk about it in the comments below. So awesome questions this week. Again, if you have a question about some theory or some chords or um, guitar, gear, anything you want, leave it in the comments below, and we'll get to it. All right, guys. So uh, as always, let me know what you want with. Until then, I'll see you next time. Thanks a lot.